Excellent. Okay, so for today's today's goal, we'll get through 3.6 on control. So up until today, chapter three has been all about how do we take the concepts of data and how do we actually implement them in at a system level uh, uh, realization. And then once we do that, how do we access that data? How do we mutate that data? I think the last thing we really looked at is how do we apply operators to process that data, right? Where we can use the data as input into a set of operations that the, that's defined at the system level that produces output that's meaningful for us. And so again, these are all the building blocks, the fundamental foundational building blocks that create for us the higher level environments that we've learned to utilize inside of Java or inside of C, which we're using for the labs. So we're, again, striving to bring a one-to-one -one parity to what's happening at the assembly level to what's happening at the C level. And once you see how it happens at the C level, you'll see since Java is part of the C family, how it interrelates to that. And then as you continually progress inside of your um, inside of your um, your coding endeavors, you'll see that other languages like Python or JavaScript, how mechanically these are all built off of concepts that are driven all the way down to the developers who worked at an assembly level. How some of these concepts like object orientedness kind of manifested from passing references around. Okay, so we, I think we got up to 3.6.2 in last lecture. So we'll briefly go over that. And then I wanna get right towards control structures because in today's lecture, I wanna see how does control structures realistically operate inside of the system level? And not just how could we hand author control structures, but what does the GCC compiler do to try to optimize control structures from a high level to a low level. So we'll look at some of the different ways we can implement control structures, uh, predominantly using jumps uh, that we are used to inside of, uh, inside of our own uh, uh, higher level languages. And so that's gonna be like your selection statements, that's gonna be like your repetition statements, your fors, your whiles, your ifs, your ifs else, your switches. Which again, I'm assuming you've all had at least exposure to how to do that by hand in assembly. Okay, so we opened up this, this uh, section last time talking about various condition codes. And of course, condition codes are gonna be pretty valuable for being able to assess when something had occurred. So we had talked about some key terms. Let me go to the next slide where the key terms are actually defined. We talked about a carry flag, a zero flag, a sign flag, an overflow flag. We already know, we already discussed that these are the one bit flag values that, are, that can be tripped, that could be toggled on the instance that something causes it to occur with any one of our other operators that we use, uh, a mathematical arithmetic operator or some kind of bitwise operation. And then we just looked at the conditions for which these condition codes could be set. And we gave some stipulations on when the condition codes would not be set. And predominantly it's when we go to a load and effective address on a quad word, or if we do an increment or decrement, the overflow or the zero flag, uh, we'll leave the carry flag unchanged on those instances. And of course there's some commands we can use to go ahead and alter our condition code without having to actually do an arithmetic operation. Again, we kind of covered this before, just gives you an idea that this allows you to utilize your condition codes in have control and accessibility to them, to be able to either read or write into them. And, so, and then, uh, and then some sample code on how we can go ahead and use, say for instance, the test to go ahead and uh, evaluate what our condition codes are with, again, without having to do a operation. So, 
so so the test part is kind of like trying to, trying to compile your code. So the test part is just a uh, instruction. So just like we've been looking at some of the other instruction sets on the prior class that allows us to move data between registers or into memory or be able to dereference a value and then be able to add it or be able to jump or, or, or push data into the stack or pop data from the stack. All of these are instructions that we're provided with that allows us to code at the assembly level. This is just another set of instructions that are designed to give us access to the um, condition codes. And those condition codes occur if say, for instance, a overflow uh, uh, happens. And, and so you have a one bit sign value that can toggle as a result of that. Well, there are some instructions that you have available where you can either read or write to those condition codes without having to actually do an arithmetic operation to force it to occur. Does that make sense? Yes, okay, let's see here. And then we put a more, and then we, we spoke a long time about the set instructions. But what I want to get into, and again, if you need a reminder, so I don't want to go through this big table again. If you want a reminder, I'm pretty sure we went through the tail end, the very tail end of last lecture, we went through this table. So if you need a, uh, a um, reminder of what that occurred, then I'm going to just go ahead and recommend you to the, uh, the last uh, video. Okay, that brings us to condition codes for comparison. All this, I think pretty much 6.1, 6.2, we're really dealing with condition codes. It was kind of prefer, it was a preface for leading us to jumps. And jumps are really going to be the instruction that's available to us that allows us to start modeling in the modern day setting, in, in, in a modern day kind of syntactical philosophy on how we code as thinking this is how we can model our ifs, our if elses, our fors, our whiles, and all the other kind of control structures that we can start designing into our code base. Because keep in mind, without the ability to jump past instructions or jump from one instruction to another, we're executing everything by default sequentially. Okay, so we talk, so talked about what a jump is. Excuse me for a moment. Okay, so there's the, uh, obviously the normal execution is what I just mentioned, that sequential execution. Jump execution just means that we can jump to some other memory address. Typically inside of assembly, we use labels to be able to define where we wanna jump to. We'll, we'll talk about multiple ways that we can jump actually. So let's get to that slide. Let's start with the simple jump example, which you're probably already familiar with. And here we can kind of read the comments alongside our assembly code. So this is just a basic skipping over instruction. So here we're gonna set the value of our register RAX to zero. Then we're gonna call the JMP, that's our jump command. And then we can provide it some memory address that we want to jump to. So we typically use relative memory addresses, not absolute memory addresses. And so this is very critical because you don't ever really know where inside of memory your application is going to run at. And we'll talk a little bit about how our compiler goes ahead and ensures this all works. Uh, we use something usually relative to the uh, program counter. But in this instance, we're gonna go ahead and create a label. So when we create our label, now the label is defined inside of our code base. So now we can track effectively where inside of our instruction set that that uh, memory address for where we wanna to jump to will be at. So here, if I have, and then uh, notationally here for assembly, we usually prefix our labels with a period. So we'll do, uh, L1 will have our jump command and the jump command will skip this instruction at line three 
and jump right to this instruction, pass it on line four. Okay. And of course, there are a number of different jump instructions that we have available. Uh, we can do either unconditional jumps or conditional jumps. An unconditional jump means we will always do that jump. We just tell our application to jump to that memory address. So what we just saw previous was a unconditional jump. It will always jump when it hits that instruction. A conditional jump, we can set some criteria that's going to cause a jump to occur. And again, I'm sure you've already fooled with this with checking to see if there was a value that's not equal to or equal to or greater and equal to or just greater or below. Again, there is a lot of different options and many of these you've probably already seen in some, some form. Let's see here, yeah. Here, the table gives you the what what you can utilize for your jump. So whether it's a label or an operand, and then a description for there. Okay, so unconditional jumps. There's take two forms, right? We can either do a direct jump, or we could do an indirect jump. A direct jump. We use a label, so what we saw earlier in our example was the form of a direct jump. An indirect jump means that we can provide some memory address that's saved into a register or somewhere else. And again, that's indirect because it's not effectively kind of, I don't wanna say hard-coded, but it's not explicitly stated inside of our source code on where it's jumping to. When it's saved in a memory address, that's dynamic. You can, you can potentially change that memory address with something else and jump somewhere else, right? So that might, a good use case of when you might use an indirect jump might be for like a function pointer. And so the examples that you can see right here uh, would be for your indirect, you can see right here, uh, for examples for indirect uh, jumps, where we can just go ahead and pass it some memory address that's in REX, for instance, as opposed to a label like we saw earlier. Okay, so conditional jumps can only be done with direct jumps. You can't do conditional jumps with indirect jumps, which means you have to jump to a label. You can't necessarily uh, jump to some dynamic memory address. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and so there are also other, there are some sets of instructions that are synonymous with one another. So just like you have like greater than or equal can be used to redefine less than based off of how you define your conditions. It's the same thing. You see, you could say, for instance, get your JE just equal and your jump zero to be synonymous. You can get, to, you can get similar behaviors with some of the similar instruction types. And I think the labs like to play around with this concept a lot, like take these and don't use those and see if you can't replicate the behavior. Okay, so let's talk about jump instruction encodings. Why do we wanna know about this? Well, it allows us to dive deeper into how we can target our jumps in both assembly and machine code and it allows us to better understand the importance of encoding methods for system linking and debugging. And so the entire point of this chapter is to bring us to the next lab where we will be using the debug. And so the idea about using the debugger is that your application is gonna be constantly jumping between different spaces in memory, right? To execute instructions. So we wanna be familiar with what's happening when our application is running in memory. Okay. So like I said earlier, we're gonna really talk about program counter or what we call PC relative addressing. 
And so this is the most commonly used method for establishing our jumps to jump between one instruction to another. So here, what we do is we simply encode the difference between our target instruction, the one we're currently at, and the one we want to jump to. And so when we want to jump from one space in our code to another, effectively, what we can do is just compute the difference in the memory addresses where those instructions exist at. So that you can think of that as an offset. So we could take whatever instruction we're currently at and add an offset value. That offset value will then bring us back or, or forward, depending on what that number is, on where we want. So clearly, the size of the offset number, which can either be one byte, two bytes, or four bytes, right? either an 8-bit, a 16-bit, or 32-bit value will depend how far back or how far forward we can jump inside of our application. Now, you don't control that. That's something that the system will take care of for you. It's just something that you should be, uh, you should know the implication of whatever the offset is for your system is going to dictate how, how, much, how much effectively set of instructions you can jump past. Okay, so to give you an idea of how this actually looks, I have some sample code here. And so this code was generated by our GCC compiler. If we passed in some file name branch.c, it's gonna spit back out this code. And so I don't think I, we, let's just walk through this code and take a look. So we can see we're gonna move a quad word, right? From RDI, so that's typically one of our parameters into RAX, and then we're going to call jump L2, right? So when we call jump L2 here, it's going to jump right to this label, which is effectively a, uh, a proxy. It's going to be a uh, relative memory address inside of our, uh, inside of our uh, code here to start executing this next instruction, where we're actually going to go ahead and use that test queue to actually then evaluate and read the sign bit, the, um, I'm sorry, the, um, the condition bit. And then here we'll evaluate and then jump if it's greater than. And so if based off of the evaluation of this, we will either jump to L3 Or if it's not, we will go ahead and just go ahead and return up. Okay, so let's see how that actually might look if we examine that inside of a disassembler, right? And here we're gonna have an annotated disassembler. So the things that we're looking at here is the first First column is your line numbers. So that is the second column you see inside of this gray box is going to be effectively our memory address values. And so again, those are just going to be uh, relative. So here, for sake of simplicity, we will start at zero and use uh, a hexadecimal notation for defining our memory address space. Then here, since this has now been uh, assembled, this is going to be the original uh, hexadecimal encoding of our instruction set. So remember our, our instruction set that we create human readable syntax for like move and uh, JMP jump and test and uh, um, jump if greater uh, JG. All of those are actually represented as hexadecimal values. So here we have our hexadecimal value. And on the other side, we have the uh, annotated value of what that retranslates into if we were coding that in assembly to go ahead and uh, assemble it, to translate it into a machine code, right? So there's the one-to-one -one correspondence between the actual machine code and the assembly code. Anyway. So the idea behind the offset is this value here shows you the offset that's being applied to be able to generate the next memory address on where you're going to jump to. 
So if I had the value of five and I took the offset value of three, I'd get the address of eight, which brings me to this location in memory. Or if I had this offset of F8, which is a signed value, which means it's a minus eight value. And then if I go ahead and add that negative value to this memory address that comes after that, then that's gonna produce a new memory address using again, this different scene that will then produce the memory address of five. So then I would jump here. So that just shows you how the jumping, when we use these, um, when we go ahead and use our labels, how what's happening under the hood is actually working. And the reason why I wanna convey and highlight that this is relative is it doesn't matter what those actual memory addresses are when our application is running, we'll still get the same result inside of our set of instructions that's inside of our program counter. It's the program counter that's managing all of that. Of course, this is only, you can only jump, like I said before, as forward or back based off of the offset size, which again is not a problem in practice. I mean, it's worth knowing probably mostly for uh, security implications though. Because one of the things that you should be aware of is if you can somehow trick an application to jump into a region of memory it shouldn't, you can start executing code that was not intended to execute. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so we talked about jump. Let's bring that into one step closer into our sophistication on how we use that to model something that looks more like a high level language behavior. So here we can implement our conditional branchings with conditional control. And there's actually, what I wanna take a look at is two different ways that we can effectively do selection statements, two different ways that we could do branching logic. When I say branching logic, you should be thinking in your mind, ifs, if else's and switches, right? Okay, so predominantly I wanna cover, we'll cover the if else, but what I wanna do in this, this subsection is kind of compare the if else in C to the if else in assembly. And what we might take a look at, I don't recall if it's in the selection or if it's in the, uh, the looping section is uh, an introduction of the go-to uh, keyword in C as well, so that we can kind of create a very, clear a line between the C to assembly code. Yeah, so uh, I see a comment that you could do buffer and stack overflows, a hijack control flow. And yeah, that's, that's, that, that is how exploits actually occur. And if, you, if you're interested in learning more about that, you should probably go to uh, either CTF or, uh, or even, uh, I wonder if they do any of that with the um, intro to cybersecurity class that they have. And as we do our labs, our, our labs will kind of delve into using the debugger and seeing what happens and, and whatnot. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll play around with that. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about side effects in C functions. So when we have a function and we, we say something has a side effect, what we mean by that is it affects a non-local value. So it's important to understand that uh, in C, right? So in Java, pretty much all of your data is scoped into your class. Now you can have static attributes in your classes. And so maybe you've seen when 
in Java 1, they introduced the static keyword, how you might be able to mutate the static um, value uh, field, the static field inside of a class from an instance. And it's, it's, it's you, even after something falls out of scope, the effect on the class is still maintained, right? I'm pretty sure there's something like maybe an employee class that you might've seen where each time you instantiate employee, it increments it, and then at any time you can read it. That's, I guess, the Java version of a side effect. The idea is that you have a function that gets called and the function mutates something that's outside of the scope of the function itself. So the function didn't just return something, it actually, and it didn't, it didn't use something that was passed into it necessarily. It actually changed something in a, say for instance, global space, something that's kind of available to all other functions outside of it. Probably the side effects you're most common with are the register spaces, right? Because those all hold the value and all of your instructions are sequentially using the registers to store and read values from. And so you have to be hyper vigilant and aware that if there's a meaningful value in one of your registers, you put it into another register, or you push it somewhere, or you save it into memory somewhere, and then you, uh, you retrieve it again after you do an instruction, right? So you're already aware, just working at an assembly level, you have to always be aware, I don't want to use the word aware again, but you want to be aware that side effects occur based off of the instructions you use. So let's talk about how side effects can occur at the C level then. So suppose I'm going to create this function here that's going to be called absolute difference SE, where SE is for side effect. And here we're going to have two variables declared outside of our function. So this is going to be effectively in our global environment where we're going to declare these variables uh, less than count and greater than count. That's what those terms are going to mean. I'm not a big fan of using abbreviations inside of my variable names, but I've pulled this code directly from the book. Okay, so then what is our absolute different side effect going to do? It's gonna have two parameters, an X and a Y, and it's gonna return back a long value. We're gonna declare a result. We're gonna evaluate if X is less than Y. Uh-oh, did not want that to happen. And if it, if it is, then we're gonna set result to be Y minus X, so that, again, the absolute difference means that we get the positive value, right? We're always going to return the positive value of the number of units that's between the two values. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and set result to x minus y. Now, in each of those instances, we're not just setting result. We're also incrementing less than count and we're, or we're incrementing greater than count. So after the function gets called, these values are going to update each time. So we can call this again and again, and then we get a count. So this is actually pretty much what I was saying before on probably the example you saw with the, uh, with the um, uh, employee uh, example. And again, whenever you have a behavior like this, that's what a side effect is going to be. And so you should be, you should be aware when, that, when these uh, side effect behaviors occur. Okay, so let's take a, a, another example of, so the point of introducing this is you've already seen if else is without side effects. I didn't make a slide for that, maybe I should have, but you already know what an if else is. This is just an if else with a side effect condition. And so the next one is what would an if else look like if we wanted to use the go to uh, code inside of SIG. So if we start using labels in C, this way we use labels in assembly, because that'll act as a baby step from assembly to C. Now I should say, we're doing this for pedagogical reasons, right? Don't use go-to labels inside of C because we have the much more verbose 
uh, vernacular of if, else, for, while, and whatnot. Okay, but if we want to see how it works, we have the same, we have a go to diff side effect, right? So we're going to declare our function. We're going to declare our local variable. We're then going to do our check. If X is greater than or equal to Y, then we're going to call go to. And go to works kind of like the GMP, the jump instruction, where we can then pass it some label and it's going to go to that label. So here we're going to have a label X greater than y. And so on the instance that we um, go to there, we'll increment, we'll do our side effect, we'll increment our greater than equal to counter. We'll set our result to be y, I mean, x minus y, and then we'll return our result. Now, if we didn't go to, right, if we didn't jump to that other label, then that's effectively going to be our else because then we just fall into this next set of instructions where we'll increment the less than counter, we'll set our result to y minus x, and then we return result. Okay, so does everyone say this is still C code, it still has the same behavior as the if else we're used to seeing, it just uses the go to labels. And so the reason why I wanted to like introduce that was so that now we can then see it inside of a symbol. Where here, I'm gonna create my label, absolute diff with side effects. That's effectively gonna be like my function. Here, I'm going to compare my X and Y values. Remember when you call effectively a procedure inside of assembly, your parameters are loaded into a predefined set of registers. You can have up to six registers that are set with parameters and then they're pushed into your data stack. I think we talked about that last time, right? That, or, oh, we're gonna talk about that in the future, I think. I'm getting my time crisscrossed. The procedures are the next thing we're gonna talk about after we talk about control structures. Okay. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to do that comparison where instead of the if and a go to, we're gonna jump if L2 is uh, on a uh, greater than or equal to condition. So here it's gonna jump to L2 if X is greater than or equal to Y, the two values inside of those registers. Then we're gonna increment our less than counter. We then move our Y value to RAX so that we can then compute the difference between Y and X, right? We'll, we'll do the subtraction and then we would return our result. And then inside of our L2, we would effectively increment our greater than count. We would move our X value into RAX. We would compute the difference between X minus Y and then return the result. So again, if we, I wanted to show you side by side, the C code to the assembly code. So it's basically, um, that C code is translated to the assembly? They're, they're, they're pretty close, right? The idea is that I can organize the set of instructions so that the logic flows in the same kind of way. The instructions themselves are slightly different, right? I have different keywords, right? Like I have ifs and go tos in C. I have jump greater than equal. I have add, I or add Q, move Q. Uh, I have to move things in the register. Like I have more steps I still have to do in assembly, but you can see how the basic structure of my selection, my branching logic is the same. How I can start modeling the concept of is else as a collection of jumps to labels. And so just to clarify, everyone is familiar with this with assembly. This is something you went through in assembly. Okay. So let's move on then. 
So we have our general form of our if else, which you see here. So I will not general form in assembly. Okay, so. So we already discussed essentially how we're doing our jumps based off of our conditional controls. But there's more than one way we can go ahead and define our branching logic. We can also do conditional moves. So now the question is, is it better to do conditional controls or is it better to implement using conditional moves? So again, this is our conventional way in state, right? Given some x, y, y value, if x is, is less than y, you set your result, else you set the other result and you just return the result, right? That's what we've been seeing. We have two. And so what we're seeing here is we have two moves, jumps. We have two blocks that we're deciding, do we want to do this block or do we want to do that block? And we're jumping around in memory to be able to do that. Well, the cost of jumping, there is a cost to jumping around a memory. So if we want to prevent that, we can do a conditional, um, and if we want to uh, avoid the conditional control, we can just do the conditional move instead. So here, let's take a look at what that looks like implementation wise. So in that instance, in this function, I would compute both results y minus x and x minus y. And then I check this difference. I set a Boolean value effectively to tell me what the difference is, to tell me which one I'm actually going to uh, assign. And then I'm gonna return that value. So let's break that down one more time. I'm getting my right evaluation, I'm getting my left evaluation, right? So y minus x and my x minus y. So I compute both results and I'm gonna store those. Then I'm gonna check to see if x is greater than or equal to y, which is gonna be a Boolean value. And then I'm gonna set that to this end test. Then I'm going to use my if check which is either going to be true or false. And based off of on um, if it's true or false, this is going to execute or not. So either I'm going to execute that or I'm not. And then I'm going to return this value. So that value either gets overridden if the other one was true and it stays the same if it isn't. So it gives me the result of a if else behavior without having to jump twice around inside my code base. Let's actually take a look at this. Let's see if I... So this is what it would look like in assembly. So again, I'm going to move my Y into my RAX register. I'm gonna compute my Y minus X and I'm gonna move my X to... Uh, RDX, and then I'm going to compute my X minus Y. Then I'm going to compare Y and X. And if X is greater than or equal to Y, we're going to move to RDX, move RDX into RAX and just return that back. The point of showing you this is we can get branching logic without the computational intensity of having to jump around a lot. If you're wondering how optimization tricks sometimes happen, these are things to consider. So I guess to compare this with our conditional jumps versus our conditional moves, a conditional jump could be eight to 27 clock cycles, depending on the prediction. Whereas with our conditional moves, you consistently get around eight clock cycles. Okay, and now in terms of your conditional move instructions that you have, 
that we saw based off of the source code we saw before. And again, let me go back so we could see, because I don't think I highlighted it. These in particular, right, were our conditional move instructions, right? Instead of using jump greater than equal, JGE, we're calling to go ahead and um, do a conditional move on greater equal. Here, this is compare a quad word. Oh, let me go back, I'm sorry. Okay, here on line six, we're doing a compare a quad word, and that's where we're doing a comparison of Y and X. Then we can use that to do our conditional move on greater than equal on these two registers. And so here we can see all the different conditional moves that are available to us. So for instance, we have a conditional move uh, on, on equal, a conditional move on not equal, a conditional move on a signed value, a conditional move on a, a non-negative signed value. So on a signed value, hey, expect the sign to be there, non-sign, and S, uh, a conditional move on a, uh, on a uh, greater than, on greater than an equal, less than, less than equal, and then you have above, above or equal, below and below. Okay, so let's talk about the general form of uh, our conditional expressions. So again, we now at this point look at, well, we've seen the ternary operator, right, in Java, C, whatever, right? Uh, it has three different operands, your truthy value here. If it's true, then that's your then expression. If it's false, then that's your else expression. And now at this point, We've already seen how we can do that in a conditional control in assembly and in a conditional move. And we can then, again, I just wanna highlight the two distinguishing kind of templates but that we can define for those. So you could kind of see how those uh, uh, kind of deviate. So when do you wanna use conditional moves? Um, well, it can't be used if expressions have side effects or generate errors. Right, then you want to use the more classical approach. That's why we introduced the concept of side effects, because you're doing all of the computations at once. And so you're not jumping around inside your code block. But on the instance of side effect behavior, you're kind of using the fact that you're jumping around your code blocks as part of the logic. And then uh, the efficiency that you get from these conditional moves really depends on the computational cost of the expression. So it might actually be more costly to compute all the possible results than actually doing a traditional uh, um, conditional control where you only do one of, instead of if there's several thousands of results, it might be better just to do a conditional uh, control implementation then. Okay, I'm done with selection statements. Any questions about that? Did y'all cover pretty much all those concepts and how you can model if else select as, as either con, uh, conditional moves or conditional control structures? Okay, good. Okay, let's talk about looping. And really the thing I wanna do is take your concept of looping and assembly your concept of looping in C or Java and make sure that they're firmly attached to one another so that you'll be well equipped to use a disassembler. So we're gonna look at the do while, the while and the for loops. And again, all of these concepts, these key words, we get those behaviors the same way we get the branching logic by using the ability to be able to jump around and create labels and jump around different memory addresses. 
Okay, so our base, we'll look at our do while first. So the basic syntax of our do while is we use the do keyword, we follow it up with the while. The one takeaway with the do while loop is you're always guaranteed to execute to that block, right? That set of instructions before you evaluate and decide whether you're going to execute it again, right? Okay, so this is going to effectively be what our do while loop looks like using that go to keyword inside of C. So again, let's create a label a loop. And then what we'll go ahead and do, notice again that these labels we use are very much look like what switch statements look like in Java, right? The switch statement, it its genesis goes into effectively having like these lookup tables. Uh, but so, so you see the syntax is going to be whatever that uh, label is along with the colon. Anyway, so we're gonna, then going to have whatever our body statement is and whatever our test expression is, and then we'll check and then jump back to our label, right? That makes sense. That gives us the same behavior that a do while control structure gives to us. Okay, let's look at some C code just as an example then. We're going to define a function, factorial do, that takes in some long number. We're going to produce a local variable called result that we'll set to the value of one. Then we will use the do while control structure to go ahead and take whatever result is, multiply it by whatever, and uh, uh, do a compound assignment. So we'll take the value of result and multiply it to the value of n and then set n equal to n minus one. So we're decrementing the value of n by one. And then we're going to check that. We're going to check to see if n is greater than one. And if it is, we do it again. And we'll do it again until we don't do that anymore. And then finally, we'll return the result. Okay, classic do while loop. Okay, this is going to be our do while loop with the go to syntax. Here, I'm going to define my function. And now I'm going to just append go to to remind myself, oh, this has been implemented with go to. Here, I'm going to create a local variable. Uh, result, set it to one. I'm going to create my loop label here. I'm going to do the same logic, right? I'm going to take n, multiply it to result, and overwrite result with that value. Then I'm going to decrement n by one. I'm going to check to see if n is greater than one. If it is, I'm going to go to loop. And when it's not, I won't go to, I won't do that jump and I'll just return the result. Any questions between those two? Pretty simple, right? And then finally, if I want to implement the same behavior inside of assembly, we can say, okay, let's define our procedure, our factorial do. Here, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to initialize our result of EAX to one as we start calculating the factorial. Then inside of, we're gonna create a label L2. We're gonna multiply the current result, that's an RAX by the current counter in RDI. We're gonna decrement our counter, RDI by one. We're gonna compare the counter, RDI with one. And then we're gonna say if the counter of RDI is greater than one, we're gonna jump to the loop start at our label there. And if it's not, then we're gonna return. So again, if I compare these one to one, you kind of see how the logic, there's a little bit more management that has to do with the registers, but the basic logic is effectively the same. Okay. So when we're gonna talk about while loops, we're gonna see that there are two different ways we can translate our while loops. We could do either a jump to the middle or a guarded do. And we're gonna look at the difference between these two. So again, basic expression of while loop, everyone knows how to do a while loop at this point. And again, let me highlight, just so I'm on record, a while loop does not guarantee that the block of code it's associated with executes at all. 
right? That's the distinguishing factor between a do while and a uh, while and for, for instance, as well. We'll look at for a moment as well. Okay, so in this instance, let's look at uh, uh, jump to the middle method for uh, generating our traditional while. So let's create a, a go-to test. So the first thing I do is I'm jumping to my test label, which I'm gonna put here. So I have two labels, loop and test. One's to evaluate whether I should loop or not. The other is the block of code that I, can, I could repeat. So this is gonna be my body state. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump past the loop portion to the test portion. I'm gonna evaluate my expression. I'm gonna see if it is true. If it is, I'm gonna jump to loop and actually execute that loop. And then I would fall down into the test. The, I'd fall past test into this evaluation, this test expression. I would do that again until T is false, right? Does everyone say, is that, okay, perfect. Okay, so let's take and redefine our factorial function using our while statement. And again, what we're calling this is jump to the middle. Do you see why that's called jump to the middle? We start with a go-to, then we have the looping body, and then we have the test expression. So the idea is that we're jumping from the top immediately to the test and then going back into the middle, which is gonna be the loop expression. That's where the term jump to the middle means, right? We go from here, we jump here, and then we jump into the middle. Okay, so basic implementation, we have a factorial while loop, right? We set our uh, result value to one, while n is less than one, I mean, greater than one, we'll keep multiplying the result and decrementing n, our loop control variable, and eventually we'll stop and return the value, right? Let's look at the exact same thing, but using the go-to structure. So here's my factorial while, loop using the go-to, using jump to middle, JM. So we're gonna create a local variable result, set it to one. Then we're gonna use the go-to label, right? We're gonna use that same template we used before to jump down to our task, see if N is greater than one. If it is, we're gonna go to loop. We're gonna jump back up into our loop. We're gonna take our result and do that compound assignment with a multiplicative property on N. We'll decrement N by one and then fall back down here into this test. And then finally, we'll return the result. You had a question? I thought jump to middle meant the first go, the first jump. Because like, if you remove go to test and test, you're left with the do while loop. No, so yeah, thought, you're right, exactly. So I thought basically it's jumping into the middle of the do while loop. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're, you're in the fact you're, you're taking the go to here, and then you jump to the middle here, where you avoid actually executing the loop that initial time. No, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what it's referring to, is that the, the middle portion is your loop structure, which is what's happening with the do while. Maybe I, I articulated it. Um, kind of not well, but no, good. Thank you for the clarification because we, we're gonna wanna contrast that to the guarded do. And again, before we do, before we go to the, the, the uh, guarded do though, let's move from the C go to, to the assembly just so that we've very painstakingly taking this walk from a traditional while structure to the go-to while structure to the assembly uh, uh, variant. So here we're gonna have our procedure, our label that defines our procedure. We're gonna initialize our result to one. Here we're gonna jump to our L5 label, right? So we're gonna jump past the loop to be able to go ahead and compare our n value to one. And if n is greater than one, then we're gonna jump back up 
to our looping structure right here, where we go ahead and produce our multiplication. Then we're gonna subtract or decrement our value of N that's inside of our, our register by one. And then we'll go back, we're gonna fall right back down to the next line. That's gonna be the test portion of this code block. And it's gonna do that comparison again. And then it'll determine whether it jumps back or not. And the moment it does not jump back, we'll then go ahead and return control back to whatever the invoking uh, procedure was. So we could see, again, there's a one-to-one -one parallel to our go-to and our go-to has a good, at least logical um, uh, set of calls to the, what we would traditionally see in a high level language. Okay, let's contrast that with our guarded do. So our guarded do is gonna look like this. We're gonna have our test expression. We're gonna see if it's not true, if it's, so suppose that we have our test expression and it's true, then if it's not true, we will go to done, which will be down here. And otherwise we're effectively doing a do while. And so what we mean by guarded done is we're jumping, we're, we're checking the condition ahead of time and jumping past the do while. So we guard that do while by putting a check and jump in front of it. And so let's see how that goes ahead and contrast. So using our go-to syntax. So again, we're gonna have our key uh, local variable of result. We'll set it to one. We are getting this value that's passed in as a parameter n. We're gonna check to see if n is less than or equal to one. And if it is, then we're done, right? So here we're just gonna go to done, which is gonna go to where we're returning the result. And if that's if it's not, then we're gonna do the do while. So here we're gonna define that loop but we naturally fall into this where we then go ahead and we take the multiplicative of end and overwrite our value of result. We, de uh, we decrement n by one. We check to see if n is not equal to one. And if it is, then we jump back to loop. And we'll keep doing that until n does become one. And then we just fall into the done and return result. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions? And you, you see the, the slight difference between the guarded do and the jump to middle approaches. So just like there's two different ways to implement our branching logic, we have two different ways to implement our traditional while loop. And again, if we wanted to see exactly what that looked like inside of assembly, we're gonna define our label here. We would do our comparison. Based on the comparison, we would jump to L7, which is gonna be our done label effectively here, where we would then move our value and then return back out. Now, if it wasn't, then the rest of this part right here would look just like our do while that we saw before. Okay, let's take a look at four statements. And the key part that we were gonna to wanna to look at with four statements is gonna be, uh, again, the fact that a for loop initializes, it tests and it updates an expression, right? That's the interesting things that defines a for loop from a while loop or a do while loop. So again, this is our basic syntax. You're already familiar because C does it Java does it just like in C. Okay. You're already familiar that there's an equivalent while look variant of it. We can actually, because for loops and while loops have similar behaviors, right? 
we can implement four loops using either jump to middle or guarded to approaches, right? So if I wanted to do a jump to the middle approach, right, you would have whatever your initialization expression is, then you would go to your test, right? You jump down to your test here, you get whatever the evaluation of your test expression, decide if you jump into the loop portion here, or with the guarded to, you do your initialization expression. You, and of course your update expression is inside your body state, right? Uh, with the jump to middle, and that's gonna be the same case in here. So wherever your body statement is, you do your update expression after it. Okay, for loop, a factorial looks exactly what we probably think it should look like. You have your, um, let's say variable long i, you have long results, so long as then you're going to in, uh, assign i. So we're not initializing in this instance, but we'll, we're doing an assignment. We will do an evaluation. We'll do an update expression, right? And then we do the body of our loop and then we return a result. in our um, this is just converting into while logic. We saw that in 1583. Let's jump past that. Okay, let's look at it using go to logic. So I'm defining on the first line here my function call. On the second, I'm initializing my value to whatever this, what the uh, starting value has to be. So i is equal to two, setting my result to one. I'm going to jump to test. So this is our jump to middle implementation. Then we're gonna check if i is less than or equal to n, then we'll jump into the loop section where we have our loop, our, our loop body, which is where we're multiplying to a result value. Then we have our our uh, update expression that's going to update our loop control variable, which is our i. Okay, so now let's look at the assembly code version of that. Did y'all have like assignments where y'all did like the while loops and for loops and do while loops inside of assembly to get familiar with implementing everything? Uh, a while loop for assemblies? Yeah, yeah. Did you author or, or read or I'm just out of out of curiosity, like what was the what was the kind of delivery of learning your control structures in assembly? <laughs> well, it's a good thing we're doing a kind of a a refresher that already set for us. Oh, I got you. And then you kind of just played around and, yeah. and saw how it worked. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. Just just to be a completionist and to do the for loop, we're going to create a label, factorial four. We're going to initialize our result to one. We're going to go ahead and initialize our loop variable i to two, right? So edx is going to be our loop variable and eax is going to be where our result is going to be stored at. Then we're going to do an evaluation and we're going to jump to the test condition to L8 here, where we're going to compare I to N. So recall that we have our um, value of RDI, which is going to be our value of N because our parameters get loaded into RDI. That's one of the uh, registers where we're gonna get a parameter. And then we have our value of I, which we set in the uh, EDX register, right? So we'll use the 64-bit register of EDX to do that comparison. So we'll do a compare. And then based off of that, we're gonna determine whether we're going to jump to L9. If we do jump to L9, then we're gonna do the multiplication between RDX and RAX 
right? Those are the two values we've moved in initially. And then we will go ahead and we will um, uh, increment our RDX value by one. And then we'll fall back down and do a comparison. Until we go ahead and send a return. And finally, the last control structure, and we're done with this chapter, is the switch statements. So switch statements, as you're familiar in Java, is a way to do a multi-way branching where we can use, say, for instance, an index. And effectively, it's a very inf uh, efficient implementation of what we call jump tables. So what is a jump table? It's effectively an array where each entry is the address of a code segment for a specific case. And so the time to perform the switch is independent of the number of cases. So a quick example in C of a switch statement where we have, say, for instance, I have this switch where I have an X value, an N value, and some uh, pointer to a destination. I'll set my local variable val to X. And then I'm going to switch on N, the second parameter, and on the instance of any of these numerical values, these integer values, on the case of 100, 100, 200, 300, 4, I will go ahead and execute that block of code. Of course, I need to have a break statement if I don't want to fall through, because effectively it's a label, right? So it's kind of like the labels we were seeing before. So if we don't use the break, we just keep falling down to the next set of instructions. However, if we use the break keyword, then we jump out of that block of code altogether. OK, so let's take a um, different look at our uh, implementation of a switch using an extended C translation, where we can kind of get a better grasp of what's happening with this jump table. So here's an implementation where instead of using the keyword switch, you can see effectively what's happening is I can have, like in that, that prior example, an array that is a collection of memory addresses. And my cases are a mechanism by which I can jump into a pointer of where those instructions are at. Okay, so the double ampersand, do you remember what the single ampersand means? Mm -hmm. So imagine if you had an address of, address of. But what would that be? It's like the address of. You know what we should do? Well, how much time do we have? 613. Let's play around with some of the pointer logics actually in class next class, where we'll open up some C code and play around with the results that we can go ahead and reference and dereference. It might be, actually, I've been kind of intending to do more like hands-on lab stuff in the class. So maybe next class we can play around with that. And yeah, I don't want to go through and spend the last few moments talk. Well, what we'll do is we'll uh, touch, we'll quickly go over the rest of the switch statements next class, because you'll see that once we start loading, effectively what we're going to be doing is lo loading memory addresses, right? We're accessing memory addresses to jump to. And so you could see that the lean in here is that we're going to be using these load effective addresses inside of assembly. But 
we don't have enough time, I think, for me to really draw the parallel between the C code and the assembly code with just the last minute I have. So we'll cover the tail end of switch statements next class, and then we're going to move on to procedures. Excellent. Any questions? Pretty soon by the time we end, as we get closer to November and December, it's gonna be pitch black outside. <laughs> Slowly getting darker and darker. Okay, I will see you all on Thursday.